Good morning and welcome to Thursday at the 231st AAS meeting here in Washington, D.C. I'm Rick Feinberg, AAS press officer, and I'm glad to see another nearly full house. Uh, today is our final day of news briefings, though the meeting does continue on tomorrow. Uh, the reason we don't have any briefings tomorrow is because uh, a significant fraction of the press corps is going to be going off-site for a press tour to the Space Telescope Science Institute. Helping me today is my new AAS media fellow, Carrie Hensley from Boston University. She's monitoring the webcast. If you're listening to the webcast, please remember to use the Q&A chat uh, to queue up your questions. Please silence your cell phones or anything else that makes a lot of noise. And I'll just remind everybody, or for those of you who are at your first AAS briefing, the way we do it is I'll make a few opening remarks and then I'll introduce all the speakers. They'll then speak in order from your right to left, um, and then we'll do questions at the end. I should mention that uh, there are press releases for all four of these presentations. Uh, they will all land in the AAS press list mailbox uh, in a few minutes. Also, I should say that the uh, videos from the previous two days briefings are now online uh, if you go to the archived webcast page and hopefully by t uh, either later today or tomorrow, uh, the links to press releases and links to the presentation files will be on the press kit. Okay, so the theme of today's briefing is it's amazing what you can do with space telescopes. We're gonna hear a variety of results from space telescopes across the spectrum. And uh, one of the things that's particularly interesting, I think, is that we're gonna hear what I believe is the first science, uh, first interesting results presented at a AAS meeting from the International Space Station, which is cool. So we're gonna hear from four speakers. Uh, the first will be Keith Gendreau from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He'll talk about pulsar navigation with NICER sextant. It's a NASA presentation, so it's got a big acronym. Then we're gonna to go to Will, Will Clarkson from University of Michigan Dearborn. He's gonna tell us about using the Hubble Space Telescope to chart the proper motions of sun-like stars in the galactic bulge. Next will be Julie Comerford from University of Colorado at Boulder. She'll be telling us about a black hole double burp observed with multiple telescopes. And then finally, Brett Salmon from the Space Telescope Science Institute will tell us how Hubble used the gravitational force to find a galaxy far, far away. And I will now turn it over to Keith. Thank you, I'm Keith Gendro. I'm the principal investigator for the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer, or NICER mission. It's on the International Space Station. It's an X-ray telescope that's trying to understand the nature of ultra-dense matter by looking at the X-ray timing characteristics of neutron stars and pulsars. We have a technology infusion program as part of our science mission called SEXTANT, which stands for the Station Explorer for X-ray Timing and Navigation Technology. It's flight software that works within our computer on NICER that will look at a subset of pulsars that we want to look at for science purposes anyhow to use them to do a new type of navigation that makes use of this uh, infrastructure of pulsars that's naturally available around our galaxy. This past November, we have successfully demonstrated the first autonomous navigation using pulsars alone for, a deep, for a spacecraft, the, the International Space Station. So what are neutron stars and why, are this is, why is this possible? A neutron star starts its life as a star maybe 10 times the mass of our sun, burns through its nuclear fuel, and it explodes in a supernova explosion. The core will collapse into a cinder, which weighs between one and two solar masses, but will only be about the size of a city. As it evolves, angular momentum is conserved, and some of these, pulse, uh, some of these neutron stars will be spinning hundreds of times a second. Um, these type of pulsars are called millisecond pulsars, and some of those millisecond pulsars will have hot spots which come in and out of your field of view and appear to blink. Because of all the stored angular momentum, some of these millisecond pulsars are extremely regular, clock-like regular. Um, and so it's the nature of this timing capability that's enabling our pulsar navigation capability. So pulsars were discovered 50 years ago and around that time, um, the Pioneer program was getting ready to send Pioneer 10 and 11, and they knew at the time 
that these were going to be the first spacecraft made by humankind that will leave the solar system, and Carl Sagan was part of that science team, and wanted to somehow put some indicator on these spacecraft in case they were found by somebody to show where they came from. So this is the Pioneer plaque, um, and um, you'll see a star-like pattern to the left. That's actually a map of the 14 known pulsars that were known at the time that the Pioneer mission was put together. And encoded in these little radial lines are ticks that tell you what the pulse period were for those, for those pulsars. And the idea is some civilization could find this and figure out where the solar, you know, where the spacecraft came from. So you can identify where the solar system is relative to this distribution of pulsars in the galaxy. Now, for nicer sextant, we've uh, tried to do a more practical implementation of this basic concept of using pulsars as beacons to navigate uh, into deep space. And we use a subset of these pulsars that the, the ticks are extremely regular uh, from these pulses, pulsars. They're, they're comparable to the ticks that you see from an atomic clock, which form the basis of the global positioning of GPS navigation system. We Want, we, we used these pulsars in the same way we use the atomic clocks of GPS satellites. We looked at the pulse arrival times uh, from individual pulsars, say a pulsar over there. If that pulse arrived a little early, that meant that we're a little closer to that pulsar. If it arrived a little later, we're a little further away. And that's the basic technique for how we're doing this navigation. Now, that's just one pulsar. NICERS on the space station, and we look at collections of pulsars, and if you can imagine three or more pulsars in different directions, using this technique, you can get a three-dimensional realization of where you are uh, within the galaxy. And um, this past November, we actually used a collection of five millisecond pulsars to, to demonstrate this. So this is actually our first result that came from uh, Veterans Day weekend. And uh, you see two curves here, a blue curve and a green curve. So we're on the space station, we know where we are. If we covered our eyes and imagined that we had no way of figuring out where we were except that uh, what our last velocity and position were, you would get this blue curve which tells you that we're, you know, we have, we're rapidly degrading in our ability to figure out where we are. The green curve um, is, what happens when we ingest into our flight software made by our sextant team um, the data from this collection of millisecond pulsars and actually produce an updated model of where we are. And what you see is in less than eight hours, we had a solution independent of all other terms that was better than 10 kilometers. And we held that capability, that, that, that knowledge for almost two days before we had to move on to other nicer science objectives. Um, so we, we, we did better than 10 kilometers, which is, you know, not fantastic compared to other resources in low Earth orbit, but if you're going out to Pluto, there is no GPS navigation system, and, and this type of system would give you a much better capability than we currently have anywhere. And uh, we're about to do another experiment later this year where we're going to take what we've learned so far from the current experiment and our current experience with NICER, and we expect that we should be able to push our errors down to better than a kilometer. Um, and, and that experiment will be coming by the end of this year. This enables a lot of future applications. Um, right now, spacecraft that go into the outer solar system and beyond uh, make use of the Deep Space Network or the DSN. These are large radio telescopes that are used to communicate with these spacecraft and you can do very precise ranging to their spacecraft, so I can figure out that I'm, you know, so many centimeters away from the Earth. Um, but in the cross direction, you have very poor information, and since our pulsars are distributed around the sky, we can actually get that cross information much better. And so, as you send more and more spacecraft into deep space, you're making heavy use of the DSN to get this type of navigational information. We hope that, and we expect that with pulsar navigation, we can actually significantly reduce that load on that system and actually enable um, you know, new exploration objectives. You know, we could, you know, we could, we could imagine, you know, flying to an outer planet and getting into a captured uh, orbit around that planet for an extended view. Um, in addition, as we're starting to look at uh, sending humans deeper and deeper into space into Mars. As you have humans on spacecraft, you want to have redundant systems, and we feel that pulsar navigation is a great 
redundant navigation system uh, to enable the safety of these missions. Um, and that's all I have right now. Here's our contact information. If you'd like to contact me or Jason Mitchell, our Pulsar navigation lead on the program. With that, the um, next speaker. See if I can find it here. Press this button. I'm sure, it's just navigating towards the presentation now. Yes. So I'm seeing just a blank screen here. There's nothing coming up. Um, it's in deep space. Yes. That's okay. We'll figure it out. I'm sure it wasn't deliberate. <laughs> we figured out how to make sure the first presentation came up okay, but we're having trouble getting back to the other ones. speak ready all right apologize it's, it's really great we got all the way to the third day before we ran into a technical difficulty that we couldn't solve in real time so we'll just have to wait Can we take questions? Uh, sure just a couple uh, well actually Larry do you have well no we can't because we don't have a way to control the microphones and then the people on the webcast will hear silence even though they know that we're having a discussion and that will make them angry. <laughs> and, you, and you know what angry people on the internet are like. <laughs> well, that's why I always start with the questions in the room. But we have uh, some illustrious webcast attendees. We have the New York Times and we have CNN. You know, pretty much all the fake news is online, so. <laughs> Anything? He's got control in the other room? So he just hands off for a minute? At this point, though. Okay, well, that's looking better. That's looking better. Because we have to restart. I think we have to restart. All right. We have to restart. We have to restart. This is one of those they can send men to the moon, but they, you know, but kind of scenarios. Is it going to come up to the reset screen? You think? Is that where it, where it normally does? Okay. Notice how cool and calm I am? It's no big deal. Just wastes a few minutes. I'm sorry for that. All right, we're getting close. We're getting very close. Now we're just waiting on Windows. which is perhaps distressing since this is a Mac.
Well, it's good to know that if I ever fail at this gig, I can go into IT. <laughs> All right, I think we're there. Will, I'll sure. turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Rick, and uh, I hope this will be worth the wait. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Will Clarkson. I'm an assistant professor at the Dearborn campus of the University of Michigan. Uh, and I'd like to advertise briefly some work myself and my colleagues have been doing to try to push back the limits uh, of what you can do in crowded stellar fields. Uh, we've used uh, nine years of archival data with the Hubble Space Telescope to chart the sideways motions, not just of, of giant stars, but of main sequence or sun-like stars uh, from different chemical populations in the bulge as they orbit about the center of the galaxy. So for just a little bit of context, uh, you can see here on the left this nice figure from two mass. Uh, the Milky Way bulge is an important galactic component. It contains about between 10 and 20 percent uh, of the mass of the galaxy, but yet its formation and evolution is still not very well understood. And so one important task facing uh, 21st century galactic astronomers is to come up with, if you like, sort of forensic tools to try to work out how the bulge formed and later evolved. And that's what we're working towards here. Um, we've developed a new observational fingerprint for the balance of, of formation uh, mechanisms that, that have produced the bulge. Uh, specifically, we've looked at, at two overlapping populations of sun-like stars in this crowded inner region of the galaxy, and we're finding from their proper motions that different extremes of the distribution of chemical abundance um, seem to move differently, as if the stars are moving on different families of orbits. So this, just to give you a quick insight into what Hubble sees here, uh, this image on the right is the view that Hubble has uh, towards the inner Milky Way galaxy. Now you do see a few uh, bright red giants here that you could typically see from the ground, uh, but thanks to the exquisite resolution of Hubble and its sensitivity, uh, most of what you're seeing here are actually fainter uh, main sequence or sun-like stars. Uh, you're really looking through the galaxy here, so you're seeing these at different distances along the line of sight from near to far. And the big idea is that as these sort of subpopulations of stars in the bulge uh, orbit about the center of the galaxy, Hubble can actually watch the near side of these populations move against the far side. They move sideways uh, due to their motion, motion through space. Um, by human standards, these are not very big motions. In about 10 years, these stars will move by about a pixel on this picture. Um, but Hubble is quite capable of measuring the, the proper motion of these stars and its variation as we look not just at but through, uh, through the bulge, even though many of these stars are tens of thousands of light years away. Uh, so for this exploratory study, we actually chose the best data set we could find for this, which is the nine-year Sagittarius window eclipsing extrasolar planet search, or SWEEPS program, uh, led by Kailash Sahu. Uh, and the second big part of this work is that we can actually dissect chemically these stars into metal-rich populations and metal-poor, which I think is quite remarkable. Uh, Tom Brown in, in 2009 and 2010 showed uh, with their Whitehall Camera 3 Treasury survey that you don't need spectra to relatively classify these objects into stars that are rich in heavy elements and stars that are poor. You can use carefully chosen filters, uh, images at these filters with a wide field camera three uh, to exploit these subtle effects on certain colors of the stars due to different chemical compositions. So we can merge both data sets. We can actually chart the motion of stars, the sideways motion of stars as a function of how deep we're looking at the image and do that separately for stars at the metal rich end of the population of stars at the metal poor end. Okay, so I'll show you two figures about this to show you the complicated motions we actually observe. Uh, in all the figures you're about to see, uh, red symbols correspond to relatively metal rich stars, blue symbols correspond to relatively metal poor stars, and these are our fingerprints of the population. Um, stars in the upper left of these diagrams are on the near side of the bulge and, mo and moving sideways in one direction uh, due to their motion. Stars in the lower right of these images uh, are on the far side of the bulge and moving in the opposite direction due to this general sense of rotation of the populations about the, about the center of the galaxy. Um, and you can see that while individual members of these shoals of stars, if you like, uh, have a range of motions, there is a definite sense of rotation um, that appears to be somewhat startlingly a little bit different between populations of different ends of the metallicity scale. 
um, it gets a bit clearer if we actually combine these two uh, diagrams into an average diagram like this. And this is our sort of our, our, our fingerprint of these different populations. Uh, reading left to right in this graph, you're seeing stars near to us through the stars far away from us. And these symbols show the, 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 the group, the average motion um, at each distance uh, grouping along the line of sight. So we're dropping a line through the galaxy and watching these, these two subpopulations uh, move differently. Uh, and indeed, stars that are, that are more, um, more abundant with heavy elements do appear to show a slightly stronger signature of, of rotation thanks to their motions than do the metal poor stars. Okay. So that's the fingerprint we have. So what are we learning? Um, we're in a situation a little bit like we've, we've discovered a new fingerprint of a very complicated process, the formation and evolution of the bulge. And now um, immediate new work is now needed to tell us precisely what, what that's telling us about how our galaxy actually formed. So two immediate next steps we want to do. Um, excitingly, while we've developed this for one particular sight line through the bulge, uh, in the archive there are other, uh, other data sets that, we, that we, we know will be sufficient to do the same analysis, to merge the rotation work with the chemical abundance work. So we want to actually assemble, uh, if you like, a three-dimensional sampling of these motions, not just by distance, but also by, by which direction we're pointing uh, through the bulge, to really extend this into a much larger observational data set. Um, the second, and I think equally important aspect of this, is the detailed modeling. Having found the fingerprint, we now want to develop the forensic science to the point at which we can actually learn in detail uh, how, the, how the bulge actually worked. So some of, some of my colleagues have started work uh, to, to mine a new set of synthetic, um, observa uh, synthetic uh, uh, Milky Way-like bulges under different assumptions to then turn those models into detailed predictions against which we can test uh, these observations uh, and others like them from Hubble. So that's where we are. We have a new fingerprint and now we want to develop it further. So I must be almost out of time, so I think I'll leave it here. Um, if you want more information, my email address is here. Uh, this, this was picked up by uh, Space Telescope for a press release, and the, the, the current version of the paper can be found uh, at that press release website, which you can see uh, on the link here. So with that, I think, I'll, uh, I, think I'll, I think I'm done. So thank you very much for your time. Good morning, I'm Julie Comerford. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm here today to show you a black hole double burp. So the type of black holes that I'm gonna be talking about are supermassive black holes, which are the behemoths that live at the centers of galaxies and weigh anywhere from a million to a billion times the mass of a sun. And so when gas comes near one of these supermassive black holes, the black hole feasts on the gas, but then it also emits some of the energy in the form of a burp. So black holes are voracious eaters, but it also turns out they don't have very good table manners. And so we know of a lot of examples of black holes with single burps emanating out, but we discovered a galaxy with a supermassive black hole that has not one, but two burps. And so this is a combined image from the Hubble Space Telescope and Chandra X-ray Observatory of this galaxy, which is called SDSS J1354. And the pink in this image shows you the X-rays that were detected with Chandra, and that pinpoints exactly where the supermassive black hole is located, right there at the center. And then Hubble shows us that blue-green gas to the south, which is extended gas that shows us this is remnant emission from a burp that happened some time ago and has had time to expand 30,000 light years away from the black hole in the meantime. 
Then to the north, there's this little loop that's only 3,000 light years away from the black hole. And this shows us there's a new burp emanating out from the black hole in that direction. And this new burp is actually moving like a shock wave. It's coming out very fast, and so it's kind of like a sonic boom of a burp. Whereas the gas to the south shows us an older burp that happens 100,000 years earlier before that, that newer burp. Um, so I thought of a, an analogy for this, and I was debating whether to use it or whether it's a little too gross, um, but I'm just going to do it. <laughs> so imagine someone eating dinner at their kitchen table, and they're eating and burping and eating and burping. And you walk in the room, and you notice there's an old burp still hanging in the air <laughs> from the appetizer course. And meanwhile, they're eating the main course, and they let out a new burp that's like rocking the kitchen table. <laughs> That's what's happening in this galaxy. We see the new burp from the more recent feast just coming out to the north, whereas the old burp is still hanging around to the south. And so this black hole is going through a cycle of feasting, burping, and then napping, and then feasting and burping again. So black holes are kind of like us in that after we have a big meal, we kind of go into a food coma, and it takes a while before we're ready to eat again. And so this black hole went into kind of a galactic food coma between these two meals and these two burps. And this is important because theory had predicted that black holes should go through these cycles of feasting and burping and napping and kind of flicker on and off. So we see them as bright when they're in the process of feasting and burping, and then we see the black hole go dormant when it's in the nap phase. And so theory predicted that black holes should flicker on and off very quickly. And so this galaxy is evidence that black holes do flicker on timescales of 100,000 years, which is long in human timescales, but in cosmological timescales, that's very fast. That's a very fast flicker on and off cycle. And so I brought uh, simulations showing this theory of, uh, of how one of these supermassive black holes eats and burps and then naps. And so you're seeing a galaxy here. It's a, it's a disk-like galaxy like this, but you're seeing it edge on like this. So kind of the dark line through the middle of that image is showing you edge on the galaxy. The supermassive black hole is in the middle, and then you'll see burps coming above and below the plane of the galaxy. So there's a time bar in the upper left, and you're seeing the first burps coming out of this supermassive black hole. And the color bar shows you the temperature of the gas coming out from the burps. So right now the black hole's in the nap phase, waiting for its next feast. And then it starts feasting and burping once again. So I've taken one screenshot from the simulation to compare side by side with J1354. And in the simulation, you'll see to the south, there's that large bubble that's had a lot of time to expand outwards. So that's a sign of an older burp that happened, just like our spatially extended gas to the south of our black hole shows remnants of an old burp. Whereas to the north, there's a new burp that's just breaking through and is still very small just like the new burp we're seeing as a sonic boom to the north of our black hole. So the special thing about this black hole is that it has two burps separated by 100,000 years. And so why would it have two burps? Well, because it had two different meals to create those two burps. And why would it have two different meals? The answer is lurking right nearby. If we just zoom out a little bit, you'll see that our galaxy has a companion galaxy right next door. And there's a stream of stars and gas connecting these two galaxies that show that there's recently been a collision between these two galaxies. And that collision led gas to stream towards the supermassive black hole and feed it these two separate meals that led to these two separate burps separated by 100,000 years. And closer to home, our own Milky Way galaxy, its supermassive black hole has also had a burp. So in 2010, these Fermi bubbles were discovered in the gamma ray and X-ray emanating from our Milky Way's black hole. And this shows that our Milky Way had a burp several millions of years ago that we're now seeing emanating as these large bubbles. 
So right now, our galaxy's supermassive black hole is firmly in the nap phase of the feast burp nap cycle, but it's just waiting for its next meal to come along. So in the future, it will probably feast and burp once again. So to summarize, we've discovered a supermassive black hole with two burps separated by 100,000 years, and this shows that black holes do flicker on and off on these relatively short cosmological timescales. And I've created a web page with a, a copy of this presentation, um, the paper about this work, and some images of the galaxies. And I'll be here uh, the rest of the AAS if you want to contact me on cell phone uh, or email with any questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you to the press office for giving me a chance to speak today. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Brett Salmon, a postdoc at the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, where I work with Dan Coe and Larry Bradley, who are pioneers of some of the work I'll talk about today. Uh, I have the fortune of not only telling you about one of the most distant galaxies that have been discovered to date, but also to do so under a bit of a cold. So if I sound stuffy, I'll try to speak up for the people online. I'll start by taking a step backwards and looking at the timeline of the universe to get a little bit of sense of context. So one of the most fundamental questions in astronomy is where we come from, our planet, our star, our Milky Way galaxy. And we don't really know what the Milky Way looked like in the very, very early universe. By studying these most distant galaxies, we can get a sense of the initial conditions that set in motion the galaxy evolution to create the galaxies that we see around us today. And Hubble gets us most of the way there to about 400 million years after the Big Bang, we can see these galaxies. And of course, with James Webb, we'll be able to see even further back in time and in much better detail. So the current record holders for the most distant galaxies in the universe see 97% of the way back to the Big Bang, roughly 3% into the age of the universe. If the lifetime of the universe were the lifetime of a person, this is around the potty training era of the universe. You can see the image on your left is a galaxy found in this deep blank, uh, blank field survey with Hubble, and the image to your right was found with the help of gravitational lensing. So what is lensing? Well, Einstein's theory of general relativity says that as light is passing by a massive object, it is bent by the curvature of space. If you imagine there's a whole lot of mass, like a cluster of galaxies, then it gathers this light and magnifies it like a lens towards our own Hubble telescope. You can imagine taking that mass and putting it in front of a blank field, and now it's kind of like a cosmic telescope, allowing us to see fainter and more distant galaxies behind it. And I'll just point out that in this little simulation of how lensing works, you can see that some of these objects are kind of stretched out and distorted. The lens is not unlike the bottom of a wine glass, just kind of distorting that background image. So this was the exact kind of idea that we used to uh, start this uh, new search for the most distant galaxies, this program called RELICS, the Reionization Lensing Cluster Survey. RELICS used the Hubble and Spitzer Space Telescopes to look at 41 of these massive galaxy clusters. The idea being if we take relatively shallow infrared imaging over many of these different lenses, we can find some of the brightest and best candidates to study with James Webb in much better detail. A paper that I wrote a few months ago found about 300 of these distant bright galaxies, uh, which were about a billion years after the Big Bang. But with all of these many, many clusters we have, some 40 clusters, we're going through and where the data is coming in, we're checking 10, 20, 30, 40 of these clusters. I'm double and triple checking every single one of them, looking for these most distant galaxies. And one in particular found something very interesting. We found this galaxy that appears to be 500 million years after the Big Bang. And not only that is one of the most distant galaxies, but its image is actually stretched out a bit from that lensing effect. And so this is 13 billion light years away, a similar distance to those two distant candidates I mentioned before. 
and you can see the scale size image of them next to each other. And so this, although it looks kind of like a blurry image, it's actually the most resolved galaxy at this distance. It's roughly 2,500 light years across after accounting for the lensing. That's roughly half the size of the small, nearby small Magellanic Cloud and roughly a hundredth of the mass of our present day Milky Way. And I'll just note that the galaxy to the top left is also found with lensing and magnified by a factor of seven, but that image just happens to not be stretched out in the same way that this one is. So why is this important? Understandably, out of the field, these kind of look like red dots, now kind of looking at a red smudge. So what is this actually telling us? Well, we don't really know how the first galaxies in the universe assembled those nice rotating disks in those beautiful images we see. So when did those disks actually start to form? We heard from the press talk yesterday from Renske Smith's work that up to about 800 million years ago, we're now seeing evidence of some of these objects having rotation. And indeed, there's a blue tide simulation which predicts that these disks may actually be present up to 600 million years. And so now for the first time, we have an object that's due to lensing large enough to actually be able to study this with some detail and find out whether or not uh, we're possibly seeing one of the first disks. So in this early stage of the universe, we can uh, use the James Webb and ALMA facilities to study this galaxy in much better detail and answer this question, are these first galaxies all just a turbulent mess or do they perhaps uh, have evidence of rotation in some of the most massive objects. And just as an example on the image to the right, we have our current view of the universe at around 4.5 microns with the Spitzer Space Telescope. And once we switch to the Hubble Telescope, we increase that resolution. So I think one of the exciting things about what James Webb will see with an object like this is, is what we can't see now, is what that detail is around this galaxy and what that structure will look like, which we can actually use on an object this big and this distant. So my contact information is below, and I'll thank you for your time. Thank you all very much. Sorry about those technical difficulties again. So uh, we'll probably run a few minutes long if we can. Uh, if you are in the room and you have a question, raise your hand. Let me recognize you, and then uh, Larry Marshall, my deputy press officer, will bring you a mic. Uh, wait for that mic and tell us who you are and who you write for. If you're on the webcast, please queue up your questions for uh, Carrie Hensley, and we'll get to those in a couple minutes. So we'll start with here in the room. We'll come down here to go over it. Uh, I'm Gover Schilling, freelance writer from the Netherlands. Question for Keith. Um, if you want to use this pulsar navigation system in future planetary probes, for instance, what cost are we talking about? Is it easy and affordable to just have this as an add-on on an existing spacecraft? You don't need to worry okay. about that. Um, so from the back. so um, our experiment on space station is rather massive. We have, uh, we, we took the available volume there to do our science experiment. We packed it with 56 parallel X-ray telescopes. We think that taking one of those 56, which would be about the size of a poster tube and weigh maybe about five kilograms, is something that could yield a, a useful result for an interplanetary trajectory where the orbit's much simpler to do pulsar navigation or uh, orbit propagation. So. With that type of size, we don't expect the cost to be very large, but we think there's also cost savings in the fact that you don't have to use resources from the Deep Space Network as much to do navigation solutions. And for certain missions, you have really no options for deep space navigation that could you know, enable certain exploration goals. So in some sense, it's priceless, but, um, but it's, it's not outrageously expensive given the size that uh, we have, and we're in the process of seeing how we can take the technology and the demonstration that we've done on space station to realize something that is practical that you could put on a deep space mission where you know mass is um, you know a premium, and so you don't want to take up as much as possible. I should also point out the instrument itself is an X-ray spectrometer, which allows us to do X-ray fluorescence analysis. So if you went out to the outer planets, the same navigation tool could be used as a science tool as well. 
Okay, we'll come down here to Steve. Steve Marin, Freelance. Keith, if you had a bunch of planetary probes out in different parts of the solar system, where in the old days we attached gamma ray, yep. and we, lear we learned something about gamma ray bursts at that time, is there anything you'd learn about pulsars from having these instruments in different parts of the solar system? So, <clears throat> I think that's a complicated question. I think um, you know if you're in different orbits, you could do different time scale analysis of pulsars. If you had an instrument with this type of time resolution with very large baselines, you might imagine doing some interesting form of um, intensity interferometry um, so that you could do very high angular resolution in certain dimensions. Um, I'm, that takes a little bit more and it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're trying to do with our current mission. Okay, we have another one over here in the far end. We always like to give our mic handlers a good workout. Next question should come from over here somewhere. Hi, uh, Emily Conover with Science News. Um, this question is for Julie. Um, so how does this um, black hole fit into sort of the um, bigger picture of kind of the variation that we've seen before with um, AGN? So like Hanny's Bohr Weep, for example, how does, it, how does it fit into what we've seen before? Yeah, so Hanny's Vorwerf is an example of seeing basically remnant emission from an older outburst from the black hole. So that would be like the, the old burp part of, of J1354. And so there are a lot of examples of those that have been found recently of examples of old uh, black hole outbursts. Um, and so this one fits in because we happen to catch the galaxy at the right moment where we could still see the old the old outburst before it faded away, while we also saw a new one bursting forth. So that's why um, this galaxy is special, because we happen to catch both happening at the same time, instead of just a remnant of an old one. If I could follow up before we go to this question back here, uh, is this the first such instance, or have there been any other finds in the past of what looked to be remnants from two different outbursts? Yeah, there's, a, there's, another, there's another galaxy that looks to be similar that has two outbursts coming out at the same time. So I think this is, there are two then, so these are kind of early days of finding these things. Yeah. Okay. Question for Julie. Can so, you identify yourself, please? Yeah, Hans Zinnecker. Um, question for Julie. You showed these blurbs, but one, they're all one-sided, it seems. Why are they not bipolar? Ah, uh, yeah, so, so sometimes, like the, the burp for the Milky Way I showed, it looks symmetric. There are those two bubbles coming out equally, but that's just one feeding episode and one burp. So sometimes burps are symmetric like that, and sometimes they're just one-sided. They just go in one direction. And the reason is because uh, sometimes there's material in the galaxy near the black hole that's blocking a burp from getting out. So in, in J1354, there must have been material blocking um, to the north. So the first one only went to the south and then the second one could break through and go to the north. Do we have any questions online? Mm -hmm. Yes, why don't we go to those for a moment. Um, this question is for Julie from Nola Taylor Red, freelanceforspace.com. How long does it normally take the gas from a burp to dissipate? Uh, it dissipates in less than a million years, so of order 100,000 years. All right, I'll have a follow-up as well. Oh, then we'll go to you. Um, so now that uh, you said there's now two of these double burp g galaxies, um, is the other one also near a companion so that it's feeding presumably from material coming from another galaxy? Yeah, the other one is not actually near a companion. So you, you don't need a collision with another galaxy to fuel a black hole. You can just get your gas from your own galaxy without merging with anybody else. Um, and so this one's special because it has that companion right there that shows you, oh, that's the collision that caused these two different feeding episodes. Okay. Question, question for Keith. Do you want to say a few words about the coordinate system you use for this navigation? Because everything's moving, right? Yeah, so you know, we, we base it off of what we call the solar system barycenter. We look at the center of mass in the solar system and we bring all of our time scales to that period. And 
as part of our solution, we try to uh, um, accommodate the fact that these pulsars are moving on their own trajectory. We have an ephemeris that we maintain for them that's folded into our solution as well. Um, so strictly speaking, as you go very, very far out, you can expect some errors because of the fact that we're doing it relative to the solar system barycenter, but still the overall effect is that it's much better than you could do with you know, Earth-centric ranging experiments. Okay, I have a question back here from Ethan, and then we'll come back down front for Steve. Hi, Ethan Siegel from Starts with a Bang in Forbes. Uh, this question is for Brett. Brett, uh, I'm curious, what would it take for you to be able to take this 500 million year old galaxy and like, undistort it due to the gravitational lensing? What would it take for you to have an accurate enough set of information to turn the arc that you saw into the actual shape and morphology of the galaxy you're imaging? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way we do that is we have an image of the entire cluster of, of galaxies in the, in the foreground, and we can basically model their mass distribution and get a, a map of how the lensing is distorting the space pretty accurately. And so the RELICS team has three independent uh, groups doing this modeling of the mass in the foreground that we can use to reconstruct that image back towards the source plane where it comes from. But you haven't done that yet. Uh, we've we've done that for this object, yeah, and it's uh, magnified by a factor of about seven in magnitude, and I think a factor of three or four in the shear direction. What I'm getting at is, are you able? You, you mentioned near the end that you have, uh, you know, you want to find out when the disks begin to form. Right. Uh, presumably, you don't really have enough resolution or effective resolution to be able to, to say anything about that yet. Right, once we get the better resolution image, then we can reconstruct that and mm -hmm. get a better sense of the disk, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll come down to Steve. So for Dr. Clarkson, uh, I'm sure the Hubble data in, in the last decade or so, which is what you've used, are probably the best for that purpose, but if you go back to WIFPIC 2, you know, the first image, there were images of the galactic bulge. We used to use them as favorite slides, and they looked a lot like this. And with such a long baseline, could you not get some advantage from using that data? Uh, that's a great question. In fact, WIFPIC 2 was, was the first instrument to demonstrate that you can measure uh, bulge proformations this precisely. Um, with, with Hubble. Um, and indeed, you're correct, the longer you wait, the better you can measure these motions. So it certainly would make sense in principle to combine uh, cameras to do this. Uh, this was tried actually with the sweeps data set. They actually did try to combine the uh, WIFPIT 2 era for one of the fields with, uh, with advanced camera surveys, but they found that the, um, the, the benefits of using all the same camera led to better precision than actually bringing in um, a different camera with more coarse pixels. So it doesn't produce discrepant results. And my understanding is that, is, is that at least in this particular field, um, WIFPIC 2 does not substantially improve the, 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 the measurement. Um, when we first did this with ACS in the mid-2000s, we had just two epochs of ACS data. Uh, you could use WIFPIC 2 to add more, more epochs and see in a straight line the motions of the stars. Um, but now that Kailash, uh, Sahu, and company have gone back to this with nine years and multiple epochs, um, they, with, just with ACS, you can see these multiple epochs of the stars moving through, uh, slowly from our perspective, but still moving. But yeah, it's a great question. Thanks. Okay. David? David Ehrenstein from American Physical Society. Um, also for uh, Dr. Clark's, Clarkson, the, um, can you give any general idea of why uh, different chemical, uh, different stars with different compositions would have different trajectories? And secondly, is there much other data already sh showing, um, any other type of data showing um, uh, trajectories that have any compositional distinctions? 
Um, I'll answer the second question first. Um, there is there's, there's substantial ground-based data where you can use spectroscopy to measure the line of sight motion. Um, the selection effects are different, and so whereas those tend to sample a fan beam, we can sample a pencil beam. Um, our data are the first time that this particular fingerprint had been found. Uh, we can do this by line of sight, uh, not just by, by, compare, by distance, not just by comparing uh, diff different locations. So we're the first to detect this particular fingerprint, although the ground-based work is finding differences, for example, in a thing called the velocity dispersion. As you track from place to place, uh, the range of line of sight velocities, that, that is a, uh, a little different for different, different compositions. Uh, the first question about why these, these might separate into different trajectories, um, we don't, I don't have a 10-word answer for that question yet. We're still developing uh, that link from observation back to, uh, back to the theory. Um, this is one of the, these, these new recent er er areas of, of intergalactic uh, science. It's been, it's been shown recently that if, if you have populations that have a, a, a sort of a continuum of, um, of spreads in their motions, then when the, when the inner disk undergoes a, a buckling event that forms the bar, uh, those different populations retain their identities. You can, you can separate them out in the simulations. Um, so at least qualitatively, there is precedent for different ends of the, of the Asian chemical distribution uh, now moving differently. Um, but as I say, ours is the first study to show that in the sideways part of that motion, uh, there are differences, and therefore, as you've, I think, correctly stated, um, we're seeing differences in trajectory that is, in some sense, the output of what those formation and then development processes were. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we can talk more afterwards, if that would be good. Okay, we'll come back over to Govert. Yeah, um, also for Will, uh, you talked about future plans to improve on the precision of these measurements and maybe different distances or whatever. Uh, I assume you're referring to future observations with Hubble, but doesn't this observation become obsolete as soon as the results from the Gaia mission from the European Space Agency becomes available? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, just a quick clarification. The, the future work for observation, I was talking about archival data sets. So there's data already in hand in the archive. Uh, where we can repeat the analysis for different sight lines uh, to do this. Uh, now, your second question about Gaia, that's also a great question. Um, if you want to dissect motions by, by distance, um, when I showed those fingerprints showing a spread of motions at different distances, that spread, was, that spread per bin was not a measurement uncertainty. That was intrinsic variation. So at a given location in the galaxy, populations have a range of velocities. So to characterize what the average star in some sense is doing, you need a large sample per location in the, in the disk. Uh, that's why we've used main sequence stars for this study, because there's enough of them that we can actually not just look at that characterization by distance, but also separate it into these ends of the, of the chemistry scale. Now, Gaia will produce exquisite proper motions and distances through parallaxes. Um, I don't think we know yet just how well it will perform down at the low luminosity level of the stars we're looking at here. Um, so it's a, it's a very exciting direction for the work to, to go in. Um, I don't think we know yet quite how well Gaia will actually work for this kind of work. Uh, that being said, though, the very deep sight lines that we're sort of plumbing through the bulge, um, they do produce a nice, uh, in some sense, scientific predictor data set for what Gaia will observe, albeit with brighter stars. So I think they're very complementary. Usually when I see images of uh, where the Gaia data set fits in, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller sphere around the solar neighborhood where the, the precisions are, you know, really, really high. Um, and whereas you're going, you know, all the way to the far side of the galactic center, I'm not sure Gaia will be actually measuring proper motions that far out. The other confounding variable is, is stellar crowding. Mm -hmm. So the, the bulge is a, is a very dense area of the sky. There are many stars per choose per square arc minute or square degree. Uh, and that's another challenge for, for the way that Gaia actually measures positions. Um, its performance at the bright end, I think, has, has so far been, been very good. We don't yet know just how, just how to what low luminosity level uh, Gaia will perform. Are there any other questions online? Yep, okay, we'll take another one. 
This question is also for Will from Nola Taylor Red, freelanceforspace.com. How do the rotation velocities of the sun-like stars compare to the more massive stars previously studied? So we have a different, a different. Um, we're measuring motions in a different, different direction. We don't have a direct comparison yet. Um, it's not, it's not yet quite clear how to directly compare our proper motions with line of sight motions from the ground. Um, what I can say is I think the union of, of our sideways motions with the ground-based um, together will tell us new constraints on how the, how the bulge actually formed. Um, but I don't, we don't, I don't have a number yet for precisely how the direct comparison looks. Thank you. You have a question down here? Okay. Uh, Jennifer down here. You're allowed to ask questions. <laughs> so, Jennifer Wiseman, NASA Goddard, for Will. Um, I'm just perhaps rephrasing a question that was asked over here a little bit, but can you say from these, you know, two, two different populations, you seem to have identified the low metallicity and the higher metallicity stars have different, different motions. Can you speculate then on whether these, this, this would give evidence for the bulge forming from two different episodes of star formation right there or from a merger of two different, uh, of multiple galaxies um, in the past? So. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. You, you've, you've put your finger on it. I think a big controversy in the way that, that we think the bulge might have formed. Uh, that's right. Broadly speaking, one mechanism might be collisional formation in the early universe. But then followed by another mechanism might be actually disk dynamics forming a bar. And the, the Milky Way bulge appears to show properties of both. So possibly first one, then the other. But the precise balance isn't, isn't entirely known. Um, now, and that's why we need these new fingerprints to try to understand what exactly has happened and can we actually tell them, tell them apart. Um, in, terms of, in terms of populations, um, this gets me into a little bit of trouble with my collaborators because it's not quite clear yet whether we can talk about two distinct formation events to produce the metal rich and the metal poor, or more of a continuum. And then in the subsequent galactic evolution, those ends of the distribution might then get separated out into what we now see as different populations. Um, I think I'd say watch this space. We don't know yet um, whether we're dealing with separate, distinct formation events or more of a continuous process. That's actually a, a frontier area of current research that the in particular, the bold treasury team are working on from their own data as well. All right, we have time for one more if there's another question. Do we have anything else online? Did you want to ask a question, Ray? Oh, okay. Just waving? All right. Hi. All right, very good. Then with that, we'll wrap up this briefing. Uh, the next briefing is at 2.15 p.m., and that is... Um, exploring the, uh, everything from molecules to disks to planets. Uh, that'll be the final briefing for the day. Um, for those of you who are attending the press dinner, uh, it's at seven o'clock at Rosa Mexicana. We're gonna just gather in the main hotel lobby about 10 minutes beforehand and walk over. Um, if you get down there and you don't see anybody else, just walk over to the restaurant. Uh, there's a map in the press office. So I wanna thank again our speakers. I wanna also thank the public information officers who uh, worked with us to put this briefing together and, and put together a bunch of press releases. Um, all or most of them should be in your inboxes by now. Um, and I thank you again and we'll see you this afternoon.